Uh, welcome back to the Blackout Show. I'm Faith, and today I'm here with actress Miss Jane Perry. So, hi. <laughs> welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. Tell us a little about yourself. Well, um, I'm a, a, I'm from Canada, and um, I but I presently live in in the United Kingdom in in London, and I've been here for I guess how long I always lose track but I think it's about 18 years now um, and uh, I, I trained in the theater in, in Canada and uh, really enjoyed doing that and worked in the theater for a long time and then decided to, to move to the UK my family is, is from the United Kingdom um, and uh, I just wanted to kind of change in life and uh, London is such an extraordinary city to live in uh, and, and so I found myself here and um, so now I, I work here as an actress and do various other things and have a family here and, and a dog and a cat. So I'm staying. That's wonderful. So <laughs> how was your approach to acting like? How did it, it all start? Well, I guess uh, it kind of started as a hobby in Canada. I, I, I was always sort of interested in it when I was in school. And then I took some time in between graduating from high school and, and you know, trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life. I, I just took some time out and I, I was doing theater, you know, acting as I was trying to figure out what I should do with myself. And then suddenly I realized, oh no, acting's what I wanna do. I, I, I'd like to pursue that. And so that's what I did. And I was very lucky, I think, to be um, a young person with a really strong sense of what I wanted out of my career in life because I, you know, I, I identify knowing what you want is the first step, obviously, towards getting what you want. And some people don't, you know, young people don't necessarily know what they want or older people don't know what they want in their careers or relationships or whatever. So <clears throat> I felt quite lucky that I had that focus from a young age and that I suppose that desire and that focus is what sort of enabled me to get on point with you know, how to get what I wanted. And so what I did, the path I chose was I went to theater school in Canada. And then, um, and then I just took every opportunity that came my way and started, started working. Um, and, uh, and, and here I am, you know, many, many years later, still working as an actress and, um, and enjoying it. And as you know, working as a voice artist as well, which I, I sort of, um, you know, they're, they're, those are being on camera and, and stage and acting in computer games uh, are, are two different things, but there's so much crossover because it's all acting at the end of the day. Yeah, it's so different uh, acting for a game. I know I know that in Italy, uh, voice actors, uh, when they uh, are dubbing video games, they cannot see the, the video game. Is it the same for you or...? <sighs> Um, I wanted to hear more about that. When you say they can't see the video game, what do you what do you mean? Like when you're actually working on it, you can't see the what's happening, or what does I, that mean? Recently, I watched an interview to a voice actor, and he said that uh, when they, you know, for example, I think Cyberpunk was dubbed mm -hmm. in Italian, mm -hmm. and I think they cannot see what uh, what they're dubbing. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't have the video in front of them so they only have the script and the director that tells them what to do but they cannot see what, oh. what the face they are dubbing looks like wow i didn't realize that that's really interesting um uh, particularly for dubbing because in my experience when i do dubbing you know so much a part of it is matching what you're saying with what they call the mouth flaps of the character that you're you're dubbing in so you have to try to to match up to that um and and when you're dubbing into a different language for example i've dubbed japanese cartoons into english um it's it's a real sort of balancing act of looking so carefully at at the animated character and trying to fit your text into the space that's made available by the um the animator and of course the original voice actor so i'm really curious as to how that would would work but um i will say that you know in computer games generally there is always a, a sort of lack of information for the actor to work with 
also, um, you know, if, if you're dubbing and you can't actually see the, the character. And, and of course, computer games, as you probably know, Faith, are very secretive about their products. And, and, and so they, they're, they're very protective of, of the content until they're ready to release it. So that's probably why that actor, you know, wasn't allowed to see anything. So us voice actors in games, we have to get used to working with very little and then becoming incredibly dependent on our director or the client, the game developer, in this case, uh, CD Projekt Red, who did Cyberpunk, to fill us in on, on all of the, the details that we don't have to hand. Because of course, <clears throat> If that actor was dubbing that character in a film, they probably, you know, they might have had the chance to read the script in advance or, you know, depending on the release of the date of the film, actually, they might have seen the film or portions of it. Um, and if you're acting, you know, in on stage or, or in a TV series, you get to see the script in advance and you have a lot of information at your fingertips in advance. But game actors, we don't have that. So it's very much... Um, a situation where we're just going with our first instincts and 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 hoping for the best and jumping in with real commitment to whatever it is we're doing and then trusting that the director or the the client will say oh actually that's too much what you're doing there or no that's not enough or you've completely got it wrong uh, this is what's happening in the scene she's actually really angry instead of really sad and 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 this is why so yeah that's really that, difficult that's, yeah it's a skill i think it's a skill you know that um that we can develop and um i i talk to a lot of people about how how to do exactly that and um uh and I think some, it's easier for some people than, than others. You know, there's some skills that sort of come second nature to us and other things like, you know, for example, cold reading is super important to act in computer games and basically cold reading, you probably know what that is, but it's being able to read a text that's just been given to you out loud and without too many errors and, and to bring it to life without having had time to read it in advance. So that's a real skill that, you know, act, voice actors need, but it's also a skill that people can develop. So, yeah. Uh, so how do you, do you try to prepare for a character that you don't really know a lot about, especially for games or for example, when you have to, to go to an audition and you have just a mm -hmm. piece of script and you don't really know much about the character? Yeah, that's such a good question. Well, it's interesting, you know, because when you audition for a role in a computer game specifically, um, that's kind of when you get the most information that you're, you're sort of gonna get because you do actually get your script in advance, the little bit of dialogue that you're gonna, you know, speak and, and um, perform. You will also, generally speaking, uh, for the most part, you'll get, a, a picture, an image of your character. Um, and then they'll usually send a little bio of, you, of your character. So it will be like, okay, this character is, she's such and such, she did this in the past and she's doing this now and she's pretty tough, but she's got a vulnerable spot because she loves Johnny Silverhand and, you know, and, and it will just go into a few details about, about who, let's say it's Rogue from Cyberpunk. So it will go into a few details as to who Rogue is and who she was. And so, and then they have this picture of her. And for me, that image of her is so instructive because, you know, a picture tells a thousand words, right? You can look at a picture of someone and you get so much information from that. So for example, I'll start to look at the way her posture, you know, how, what's her posture like? Is she, does she cock her head to the side? Is she sort of a little bit back like that? Or is she a bit hunched? You know, there's all kinds of things in the body language that really tell us a lot about who a person is. So <clears throat> I might go so, as, so far as to take on her body posture, uh, to stand like she stands. If she's holding something, I'll, I'll hold something and I'll just, I'll just try to become her uh, according to the visual image. And then I will read the bio and I'll, I'll cherry pick what resonates the most for me. In other words, I will choose things from that bio because there's a lot of information in those bios sometimes, but I'll choose sort of three or four things that really resonate for me that I know that I can 
bring to life in the audition. So I keep it very simple for myself. And, um, and then of course you've got the text and that's informative too. So it's really just about um, taking what's in front of you and really committing to that and mining the depths of the information that you do have and then not worrying too much about the information that you don't have. And I think a lot of you know, actors who act in film and TV and, and, and theater, they can get a little bit tied up in knots about the information that they, they don't have um, because they're used to having that information. But for us computer game actors, you know, you just, you just go with what you've got and you trust that everything else will just fall into place. And, and usually it does. How did you get into um, uh, game acting? Well, I, so here in the UK, um, and this is the case in Canada as well for me, but I had a, a, a theatrical agent, which would take care of my film, TV and theater work, and then also a voice agent, separate. And my voice agent would just get me auditions for all kinds of voice things. Um, and one day I, I was asked to audition for a computer game. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And off I went and uh, I got the part. And, um, and that's how I started my computer game career. So it just kind of happened in a way. And I think, you know, it's, um, it's like a lot of things. Once you become part of a community, um, then, and you start working and you develop, start developing the skills that are needed, then more work sort of comes your way. So, um, you know, in some ways, the most challenging thing is, is getting your foot in the door and getting that first game or that first job or, or whatever. And a lot of people ask me, well, how do you get your foot in the door? And I never know how to answer it because, um, you know, I, I, I think I've told this story before, but I was doing um, a play with um, some North American actors and there was this one actress who did a lot of voice work and, um, and she decided to move back to Canada. And I noticed that when she moved back to Canada, it was like a little door opened for me to pop in because I'd been sort of banging on the voiceover door for you know a good couple of years and nothing was happening. And, and this woman, my perception of it was sort of like, you know, one person leaves, they let another person in. And, uh, and I, I think, I don't know, maybe her leaving had nothing to do with it. Maybe it was just my time, but um, I, so there's a, there's something about persistence and there's something going back to what I said earlier about sort of knowing what you want. I knew that I wanted to work in voiceover. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be a computer game actor, but I was never going to say no to any kind of voice work. And I just kept, kept thinking about it, kept looking for opportunities, kept sort of presenting myself to voice agents and, and, and talking about it and meeting people, you know, and just kept putting it out there. So <laughs> it's a bit of a vague answer as to how I, I got into it and got my foot in the door, but it goes back to that intention, I suppose, of wanting to work and, and wanting to work with my voice. I guess that's where you all should start, whatever job you want to do, you, you need the will, you need to have the will to, to pursue that the dream, that idea, and hopefully yes. good things will come out of it. <laughs> I think so. You know, I think that I think that you're absolutely spot on because there's some professions in the world that are, you know, there's a lot of people who want to, to work in front of a camera, in front of a microphone or a lot of people who want to be authors or be in the creative fields or other fields. You know, there's a lot of there, there are some um, professions that are kind of oversubscribed. And so you might think, well, how on earth am I going to be a part of that industry that I want to be a part of and and just having that will and, um, and that self-belief and really you know positive self-talk uh, I think is so so important and, and so much a part of it you know uh, 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 quite apart from having a really good skill base that's important too but um, you know it's 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 I think we have to operate with all hands on deck when we want to you know become a part of an industry that where there's a lot of you know, competition, I guess you could say. So it's, it's skills and it's self-belief. And uh, just, you know, sometimes I just say, just, you know, pray. <laughs> <laughs> pray. Like this, please, God, please hire me. Like that. <laughs> That's me, actually. <laughs> you just depicted me. <laughs> <laughs> or 
maybe not please God, please hire me, but more like I see myself doing this. I can see it and I feel it. I feel this great sense of success. That's maybe a better approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and mm, I know you worked with mocap, motion mm -hmm. capture. Yeah. And I was wondering how it is uh, working with that, which is really different from acting in front of a normal camera for TV or, or a movie. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, one director I work with a lot, his name is uh, Damien Goodwin. He's a wonderful uh, games director and, and writer and film TV director here in the UK. I was talking to him about it and, and he said, you know, it's, it's uh, and also Kate Saxon as well, who's another fabulous director. We were talking about, and she directed me in mocap in Alien Isolation. And we were talking about the, the fact that it's a bit like being in a stage rehearsal, a theater rehearsal, and also being on set. So you're being filmed and, you know, they stop and start like a, a film set. And it's not necessarily going to be in sequence like it is when you're filming. But um, you have, it's almost like the beginnings of a theatrical rehearsal where there's a, you know, they have the set kind of maybe just taped out on the floor with a chair to represent something in a table. And so you have to use your imagination to fill in all the blanks. So you use your imagination to fill in the blanks of, okay, well, I have this sort of bare table in front of me, but actually what it is, is this, it's this huge console that are the instruments that allow me to operate my spaceship that is about to fly off into space. Um, so, you know, so you're just engaging your, your imagination a lot. So it's fun because um, you have other actors that you're working with and, and you can just be anything and, uh, and just dive into something. So that's a bit different from normal straightforward voice work where it is just you. There's no other actor to work with, it's, it's you in the studio. And then of course, when you're on a film set, you know, all those little details tend to be filled in, in the sense that you have a proper costume. When you're doing mocap, as you know, you've got that, that funny suit on that will capture yeah. your movement. It's got those little sensors on it. And you have usually a head camera. And so you've got this sort of get up that has nothing to do with, with the costume that you'd be wearing. So, you know, obviously when you're doing film and TV, you've got your costume, you're wearing the character's shoes, you're in the set. And so um, it just requires a bit more of an engagement of imagination. And, and sometimes that's exhausting, but other times it's kind of great because our imaginations, if we, you know, if we have access to our own imagination and some people, you know, don't, but most of us do, you can create whatever you want. It can become this very creative kind of experience. That's really, really cool. It must be a wonderful experience to to work with mocap also because uh, I yeah. know you you can really touch the objects because it would compromise the um, the capture of your movements. So, for example, I was watching the other day um, the making of Resident Evil 8 and mm -hmm. there was this character that was putting on her lipstick and she was actually doing it from a distance and it was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, it is weird. I mean, it's just, uh, gosh, it's... Yeah, the, there's this sense of just having to go with the flow and just accepting it and, and not fighting it. And I think sometimes when you're acting, you know, in an ideal situation, when you're on screen or on the stage, you're really in a very close relationship with your own impulses and a, a kind of inner sense of what's, uh, what's right and um, uh, what, I don't know, you're in a state of flow with things. And, and there, there isn't really a constant sort of interruption of that state of flow in the way that there might be if you're doing motion capture. And the interruption in, in motion capture is that sense of suddenly, okay, I have to put my lipstick on like this and, and make that look real. Or the interruption is, okay, I'm meant to be looking at a huge uh, monster right now. And basically it's, it's the guy who's um, rigging the lights, you know, or something like that. So um, it's, it's about sort of 
just kind of going with the flow and then dropping very quickly and instantaneously those little messages that say, oh, this, oh, this doesn't feel right. This is weird or, or whatever. Just kind of let it go. Let it all go and just go for it and do what's being asked of you. <laughs> it's not always easy. No, no, no. I think it's really, really hard also because you have to imagine everything. So I yeah. bet it, yeah. it's way harder than, than film acting or TV acting. I think it can be tiring at the end of the day. I think motion capture artists, of course, because they're probably doing a lot of physical stuff as well. Yeah. Some of those actors that, you know, have also been hired because they're so adept physically and they're doing a lot of uh, fighting and um, stunts and things like that. Uh, so there, there's this physical engagement for sure. And then, of course, there's the, the mental engagement, too. So I think at the end of the day, they, you know, you can get quite tired. Um, but that's that's good. It's a good tired. So you prefer um, film acting, uh, TV acting, or motion capture, or voice acting? <laughs> wow. Well, I, you know, I think the thing I love the most is being on stage. Um, that's that that's sort of the beginnings of my career was being on stage. Um, and I, I guess what I love about that is the immersiveness in it. Like it takes a long time to sort of get a play up and running. You've got all these weeks of rehearsal and you sit around and you talk about the characters and their motivation. Why would they do this and blah, blah, blah. And I, I love that kind of examination. And then there's live performance too, which I absolutely adore. So I think if I had to choose, I would choose being on the stage as, as my favorite thing. Um, but all the other stuff is, is is just uh, is so great too. You know, I feel really lucky to, to be able to act in front of a camera um, on occasion and, and to do all this voice work and, um, and the motion capture too. Although I haven't done motion capture for, um, well, I guess probably a few years now, but um, it's, it's all great fun and it's all very interesting in its own sort of different way. Um, and one of the great things about being an actor in London is you know, I get to travel a lot. A lot of London-based actors sort of travel around the world and, um, you, you know, for filming. And that's really interesting too, especially for somebody who's from Canada where, um, you know, all, all they the- They film America everything film. there. <laughs> they do, yeah. So you, you're like, oh, I get to go down the street to film. <laughs> Whereas in London, it's like, oh, I get to go to Italy or Rome or wherever to, to film. And that's, that's exciting for me. That's so, so, so nice. Um, yeah. For, uh, for Hitman, um, did you record it in London or did you have to fly to, right now I can't remember the, um, uh, the headquarters of the they're production. In, yes, they're in Copenhagen, IO Interactive. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, we did it all here in London. Although when we did motion capture for that, uh, I can't remember. I think we were up in Oxford uh, doing that. But anyway, we were in the UK. You did motion um, capture for Hitman, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I we didn't did. know. Yeah, this was, um, uh, when was that? That was Hitman uh, 1, I guess. And uh, yeah, Hitman 1. And um, it was just before uh, IO Interactive, who's the game developer for Hitman. They were partnered with Square Enix and um, they had a parting of the ways. So, um, after Square Enix <clears throat> separated themselves from IO Interactive, uh, we were going to continue with motion capture, but they suddenly they didn't have the, the same backing that they had before. So they had to sort of have a little rethink about how they were going to put the game together. Um, and, um, and they've done absolutely brilliantly because now we, we've come all the way to Hitman 3. Um, and it's just an absolutely amazing game. But for Hitman 1, we did motion capture for that. And... Um, so that was here in the UK. And um, I've forgotten what your question is. Oh yeah, yes, did I have to go to Copenhagen? No, um, David Bateson, who plays Agent 47, he lives in Copenhagen, so he did his recording there. But for the most part, it was done here in London um, with a studio called Side UK, which is involved in a lot of uh, computer game production, voice production here in London. Um, so yeah, that was, that was all here. That's so, so incredible. <laughs> I mean, you well, can work with voice acting from one side of the world, even if the yeah. base is on the other. That's so Absolutely. interesting. It's, yeah, you know, technology just makes all of that possible. And uh, through lockdown, excuse me. <clears throat> 
sorry um not it's a very a good voice artist <clears throat> um <laughs> yeah through lockdown I you know I have a little home studio so I was working with clients in North America and in Europe and all just zooming in um to my little studio in, in London and it's um you know, it's always been the case actually with computer games that you'd have the, the client would be wherever they happen to be, Copenhagen or Paris or Montreal or New York or whatever. And uh, and they would just call in, you know, to the studio and they would be on the line. So you'd be getting input from, from the client um, wherever they are in the world, as well as your director who usually, it, apart from COVID, would be there in the studio with you, working with you. About COVID, um, I guess your sector wasn't that uh, affected since it's all from your little home or... Yes, you're right. It, I mean, oh, I can't really think. I mean, there's a few industries that really did extremely well from this global pandemic. And certainly the video game industry is one of them um, because people had a lot of time in their hands and they needed a distraction so there was um, one of them <laughs> yeah yeah it served a purpose and um and i'm really glad about that um so it it's i think the, the computer game industry has just skyrocketed and it's it's you know a lot of the studios here in london uh they're continuing to boom they they can hardly fit um you know all the games that they need doing into their their schedules so it's a very uh, busy industry right now. It's doing extremely well. That's so great to hear because mm. this pandemic ruined everything. <laughs> it's been tough, hasn't it? It's yeah. been a really tough time. Yeah, I know. It's not been easy for, for so many people on so many different levels. And, um, you know, whether that has to do with work and income or not being connected to friends and family or you know, being a student and, and not being able to go to school, all those things are so hard. What's the difference in workload between a game like Hitman and one like Cyberpunk? Because Cyberpunk is such a huge game, while yeah. Hitman is, um, I guess your work as a voice actor is, is a little bit less. And yeah. I guess you, you had more space as Diana in the last chapter. I guess. Mm. Yes, well, it's interesting, you know, because Diana is a character that uh, has been in my life for many, many years now. Um, and Rogue in Cyberpunk was in my life for a, a, a kind of sh much shorter period of, of time. Um, and that's simply because the Hitman is a franchise that has existed over, you know, a long period of time. Um, so the workload for me is, um, not quite no. It's a funny thing to think about because I basically go in and I do the work when I'm called to go in to do it. And as I said before, uh, we're never given the chance to prepare. So there's no workload before the day. I mean, I'll, I'll get my script the night before and I'll, I'll have a, a read through it and make sense of it as best I can. Sometimes there's too much, you know, to, to make sense of it. It's just a bunch of lines. Uh, so I'm just like, oh, well, I don't know what to, to do with this. I'll just <laughs> wait till I get there and, and work it out with the director and the client. Um, but I'll make sure I know, you know, the pronunciation of a word, if it's in Chinese or whatever, I'll look that up and I'll make sure I know what it means. And if there's a place that I, you know, don't know where it is in the world, I'll look that up. So I'll do my basic research. Um, but the workload really happens in the room. Um, on the day. Um, so Returnal was a lot of work because I'm basically the only person in that game. Yeah, apart from and the, the it's also, uh, that was a question I was about to ask you. It's also yeah. a very different game for, from the others yeah. you, you, you played in. It, yes. It's a completely, it's a huge game to start mm. with and it's a different genre, style. It's a wonderful game, I'd say. Yeah, it looks amazing, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, you know, that uh, that was the game I did with House Housemark, and they're in Finland. And, um, oh, they're such a lovely uh, company to work with. Um, and that, the workload on that was pretty intense, you know, because I, I did a lot of hours on that game in a relatively short period of time, whereas with Cyberpunk, um, I did, you know, I'm not the 
I'm not a lead. I mean, I'm a lead character, but I'm not the lead character. There's other characters with much more engagement than, than my character. So I was in for a number of hours, but it was kind of spread out. And it would happen in little chunks and then it would go away for a bit. And then they call me up and I'd come in for a few more chunks. And that's the same with Hitman too. It, it happens little in little bits uh, every so often. But Returnal was was full on uh, on a fairly regular basis. And, you know, the character, that character basically goes insane. <laughs> she goes sort of mad. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was hard to, to keep going to that place. And um, I would be really tired at the end of those sessions, like really just emotionally drained. Cause you gotta, you gotta give it 110%. And um, yes, yeah, sometimes I just felt like I, I needed to, be transported home on a little pink fluffy cloud and put straight to bed so I could recover. <laughs> how many yeah. hours do, do you usually work a day? Well, that, yeah, so a day. So um, usually you're booked in for a four hour session because after four hours, your voice can get really tired and you'll start to hear it. Um, also in computer games, there's, it, they can be, as, as you know, extremely vocally demanding if there's lots of, you know, physical stuff that you have to act out like being hit or killed or, or being in a fight where you're throwing a punch, you have to go, oh, you know, and all that stuff. So that, that can be quite vocally demanding as well. So they're four hour sessions and we don't really get a break We're we're, you know, we're this is a group of us actors now who are really encouraging um, the voice studios to allow us to rest our voice for five minutes at least after every hour just so we can you know come back down to zero again get grounded go back in and give our voice a little bit of a rest so that's starting to happen a lot more which is a, a great thing but otherwise you're you're in and you're just you press the go button and then at the end of the four hours you press stop and then you go home <laughs> that's really tiring <laughs> yeah yeah it is yeah but it's it's also fun too you know it's one of those things that can be extremely tiring but also can be also really energizing too because you're having so much fun doing it but there are certainly moments where it's like wow this is you realize oh oh it is actually hard work um for sure yeah and uh, what about the mock-up um uh, uh, hours how how are they yeah. set so that's yeah that's a bit different so that's more of an eight hour kind of day and um, that is organized in such a way that is a little bit more like being on a film set so you might find yourself sitting in your trailer for for part of that you're not necessarily going to be on the set for a full eight hours you'll be it, you know, maybe if you're the lead character, you're playing the, the player in, in a game or whatever, then you're, you're going to be in sort of everything. But um, even then, they'll, they'll make sure you've got proper breaks and that sort of thing. But uh, for me, my experience was, um, you know, I'd be on set doing a scene and then that scene would end and then they go off and they do a scene that I wasn't in. So it's a bit back and forth like that. But those are going to be more full, full days. Well, thanks for taking the time to chat. It was lovely to connect with and you. Thank you so much for, for accepting this interview. Mm -hmm.